It is a good and joyful thing to be with you all today. Welcome to worship with Plymouth First United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Susie Hutchison, and today we continue our series on being a Jesus apprentice. There is a mighty group of disciples in this church, as Bob said, who have embarked on the challenge of reading the whole of the New Testament this summer. You are devoting a lot of time to exploring Jesus' life and will surely be stronger apprentices for it. In order to be a good apprentice, you must be more than a good reader, though. You must also be a good observer. An apprentice listens closely to the teacher and, perhaps more importantly, watches closely what the teacher does. But most importantly, an apprentice must act. They must try out their new skills, fail, and do it over and over again until they get it right. So apprentices, let's find out what Jesus is up to today. This story comes from Luke. It's in chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. While Jesus and his disciples were traveling, Jesus entered a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him as a guest. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his message. By contrast, Martha was preoccupied with getting everything ready for their meal. So Martha came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to prepare the table all by myself? Tell her to help me. The Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. One thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the better part. It won't be taken away from her. This is a familiar story. We've heard plenty of sermons on it. I've written a couple myself. But I usually read this story as if I am either Martha or Mary. I am either overly worried about getting things done, or I'm sitting at the foot of the master, disappointing my sister. Today, we're going to explore this story from a different angle. After all, we're not here to apprentice Mary or Martha. We're here to apprentice Jesus. So let's explore what Jesus did in this story and how we can do the same in our lives. Verse 38 says, While Jesus and his disciples were traveling, Jesus entered a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him as a guest. This one's pretty easy. Jesus traveled. Now I'm on board with that. I love to travel. But more importantly, Jesus traveled for the express purpose of doing good in the world. He traveled to show the power of God to people who were under the thumb of the Roman Empire, to people who were sick and and hungry, and, and to people who were oppressing their Israelite siblings in order to maintain power in the Roman Empire as tax collectors or soldiers. Jesus traveled to bring the gospel to the world. He did not hole up in a house of worship and wait for the hurting people to find him there. Apprentices of Jesus, like those first disciples who spread the gospel across the known world, we too are called to go out and share the gospel. The American church has spent decades expecting people to wander into the church so that we can welcome them with our great facilities, our good coffee, and our warm handshakes. And it's a strategy that worked as long as our population growth rates were trending upward. But those of us born between 1950 and 1968, when we grew up, there weren't nearly as many of us and there weren't nearly as many of us wandering into churches. And certainly, our children, even those who had been raised in a congregation, mostly have quit wandering in. 
But that model of church, the one that's known as the attractional church model, it was never Jesus' model. Jesus traveled. Jesus didn't wait for people to come to him. He took the good news to them. Elders of the church, do you remember how you shopped before the internet? I do. I remember having to drive from store to store just to find the right pair of shoes. I remember shopping for a prom dress that takes weeks or maybe even more than a month. And I remember that if I didn't find anything that I liked, I had to settle for what was there or decide to go without. But now, my internet ads know that I need a new pair of shoes even before I do. I can be reading a news story or watching a television show on streaming and an ad pops up for a pair of shoes before I know that I want them. And sure enough, when I, when I go to put my shoes on later, I can notice the way there's a hole in the toe or the sole is starting to pull away. The color change, whatever. Retailers do not wait for us to come to them. They come to us. Surely the good news of Jesus' life is more important than a new pair of shoes more life-changing than a new pair of shoes. So why are the retailers so bold as to believe that we would love their shoes and Christians so uncertain that the world would love our Jesus? So I ask you, where in your life outside of the church do you go? Where do you go and demonstrate the love and power of Christ? In what friend circle, club, or organization would the other members guess that you are an apprentice of Jesus? Where and how are you relieving the suffering, feeding the hungry, offering hope to the hopeless? Where are you taking the gospel? Onward. What else is Jesus up to in this scripture? Verse 39 says, She, Martha, had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his message. Now, I'm not sure if Jesus invited or merely permitted it, but Mary was in a position of honor. She was at the Lord's feet. And I know that for many of us, our 21st century uh, American context gives us a very specific image of this. Jesus sitting in a chair um, with uh, Mary fawning at his feet. But a typical common home in this era would not have had chairs. They just weren't common. There was a chair in the synagogue for the priest to sit at, and, and the king or the queen, they would have a chair. But in a regular old house, People crouch down into like a deep knee bend, a position that you might still see in some markets and gatherings and other places of the world. Or if the home was a Roman or Greek setting, people would recline on their sides with their hands propped, with their heads propped on their hand and their feet kind of angled behind them. They tuck in three to a couch with the head of the next person at chest level of the last person. Those closest to the guest of honor were the most important people in the room. So, so when we hear that Mary is just at the feet of Jesus, we hear that she is close to this honored guest, denoting that she, too, is of relative importance. As I read in the Christian Century this week, quote, Mary gets the opportunity to learn from Jesus in a gender-defying and position-defying way, end quote. You see, the culture in which this story takes place told Mary that a woman's place is in service to the household. Jesus had a different place for Mary. Jesus had a place of honor and respect. Jesus shattered the socially accepted boundaries between the people. 
Paul knew this when he wrote in the letter to the Galatians, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus. If we're going to be Jesus' apprentices, we're going to have to ask some really hard questions about things that the world accepts as true. We're going to question everything that tries to rank one person more worthy or more powerful than another. We're going to push back when the institutions of this world tell people to stay in their place and, and accept your status without complaint. Jesus showed Mary that people's value is not in what they do or the role they've been assigned. People's value is in the fact that they are a child of God. How can we, as apprentices of Jesus, help people to believe that? I remember many years ago going to a class reunion we all walked around and looked at each other's name tags and to see who we could remember, right? We looked at the senior pictures that were on our name tags to see who had aged the best and who had aged the worst. And when it came to conversation, it most often started out with, so what do you do for a living? We like to rank ourselves against each other. But there was one guy in the crowd who pushed back. When he walked up to me, instead of the usual questions, he said, I don't want to know what you've done. Tell me what your dream is for the next chapter of your life. It was so refreshing especially for someone who had spent decades raising children and not climbing a corporate ladder or earning much money. Jesus apprentices, where are you pushing against the norms that allow the world to rank us as worthy or not worthy? How are you showing people on the margins of life that they are of infinite value to the kingdom of God? How are you subverting the empire that says we are only as valuable as what we produce in this world? I should probably warn you. If you follow in Jesus' footsteps, if you start disturbing the way we've always done it, people are going to complain. People for whom the current system is working quite well, they're not going to be happy. In verse 40 it says, Martha came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to prepare the table all by myself? Tell her to help me. But Jesus does not let the complainer win. There is a higher purpose than keeping Martha happy. He doesn't send Mary back to the kitchen in order to mollify his hostess. Now my mom, she used to say, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Have you ever heard that one? Yeah, I hated it. I wasn't very squeaky. I was the oldest of four children. The one who did what she was told to do with little to no pushback. I was independent and easy to overlook when you had three younger kids with greater needs. I remember being in late elementary school and imagining this metaphor as, as a wagon with four wheels. I would lie in bed wondering if I could be a squeaky wheel too. But I hated the thought of making a ruckus. But I wanted the attention. I may have even imagined that the other wheels on the wagon would just fall off if my mother would simply ignore them. So I'm kind of happy that Jesus doesn't give in to Martha's complaining. 
Even though in the very first verse of this reading it says that Martha was the one who was the host, the one who had welcomed Jesus as a guest, the one who had put herself out for him, see, by not acquiescing to Martha, Jesus risked losing his comfy accommodations. And yet, Jesus persisted in elevating Mary's status even when the family system pushed back and demanded she resume her usual role. It gives me great hope that in the kingdom of God, no one, none of us, not a person, is stuck or embedded in their role as the family mess up or the bad kid or, or the wild one. Even if our siblings never let us forget where our rank is, Jesus welcomes us all into positions of power and esteem. Jesus holds steadfast. He explains in verse 42, one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the better part. It won't be taken away from her. Nothing that any person can do in this lifetime can make them less valuable to God. No societally imposed ranking makes a person less valuable to God. No one's truest identity is grounded in their education, their income, their address, their race, their gender, their class. Their first and last truest identity is that of a beloved child of God. That's what Jesus shows Mary and Martha and us through this story. So, are you willing to be an apprentice of Jesus? Are you ready to, to go like Jesus did and take the gospel to the world outside the church? Are you willing to quit seeing people for what they can do for you or for the world? Are you ready to see every single person as a beloved child of God welcomed at the feet of Jesus the Christ? Are you willing to speak that joyous truth into people's lives that nothing they do in this lifetime erases the image of God within them? Are you ready to let the complainers complain and not be swayed from the work of the kingdom? Are you willing to be an apprentice of Jesus? This time, that's not a rhetorical question. Are you willing to be an apprentice of Jesus Christ? Yes. Let's stand and sing number 175. Jesus, the very thought of thee.